country. We're happy to have you. And this prayer is to, then in song, is to ask our Creator's blessing upon you for gathering to that, together in unity to make this conference a success. Dear friends, our love and appreciation to you. schedules or you could try to arrange an occasion for him. 
uh, you find out that there are people who organize this and you look at his day and sometimes his day has eight meetings and ten meetings and sometimes he is just on and on giving to the people of this province and giving to the people of the country. David Lamb really does need no introduction and I'm not going to go through a long description of, uh, of his honor, but as a person who gives back to this society, his time, his commitment in every kind of way, I can't think of a better person to be opening this conference, and particularly a conference with this particular theme. When he arrived this morning, uh, I was reminded that uh, he actually plays an official role at this university. His title is Visitor to the University of British Columbia. And uh, I reminded myself, if you go back and read the act under which the universities were created, the visitor actually has the authority to do anything he wishes, uh, as far as we are concerned. So I looked carefully at his motor car as he arrived, and I said, uh, Your Honor, as the visitor to this university, we will guarantee that you won't be told or ticketed. Uh, <laughs> we are pleased to welcome His Honor, the Lieutenant Governor, David Lamb, to the University of British Columbia in this role, but also as our official visitor. Thank you very much, and welcome to His Honor. Of this subject, 
I would just want to share with you, if I may, some thoughts. Just share some thoughts with you. Now, when, when I look at the topic, when I look at the conference, the, the, the planning of the conference, and I said how timely and how wonderfully important it is. And arts and music. And I ask myself, arts and music. And I remind myself that one time I went to a garden and I saw an inscription on a big piece of stone. If thou hast two loaves of bread, sell one to buy flour. For one will nourish thy body, the other one thy soul. And I look at it, and I look at it, and I thought about it. And then I came away every time when I thought of art, when I thought of music, I came away with this thinking. <clears throat> Whenever I have opportunity to go to a community, a city, wherever I go, <clears throat> I always try to find out. Find out the general attitude of the people. Their attitude <coughs> towards arts and music. Their attitude will tell me so much of them their attitude will tell me almost like a measurement of their soul. This is how important I view arts and music, and I congratulate you. When I said attitude, I just want to quickly run through several attitudes that come to mind. Student attitude. Teachers of music, you face with a lot of students. But I'm sure you'll find students, they will come to you, eyes sparkling, and they just couldn't stop. They just want to go on and on and on. They know, you know, that they are self-starters. They are really the one who love music. There are other students who come to you because they have to, and then you know. Maybe the parents pressure them, maybe something. And, and you will try to change their attitude before they go any further, because otherwise it's a form of torture for them to go through doing something for somebody else. <laughs> they will never come out with a piece so powerful as Overture 1990, for sure. Teacher's attitude, secondly. Hmm. Teacher's attitude to me, some teachers realize how important they are in music and art. Unfortunately, some not necessarily fully realize the importance. And I just want to let you know, you teachers, you are on the front line of the battle. The headquarters back there may decide on policy, may decide on plans, may decide on what to do. But you are the one. You are the one that make it happen. You make or break it. Just remember, you are the one who really will make a difference. Thirdly, I want to touch on society's attitude. I just want to say first, just don't let society tell you that you are less than very important. Sometimes I'm talking about my past experience, not in this country, when budget need to be cut. They look into cutting something or oh, arts and music. Maybe we cut some of don't ever let that happen. You remember what I said. So the soul is measured by the attitude.
because art and music. Don't ever let that happen. Now, your attitude to society's attitude. Attitude is a very interesting thing because, as I said, you can make a break. Attitude of the society can also make or break a society. Let us just take for example, when a society faces with new conduct, <coughs> new people to the society, we can look at the new people with a attitude, an attitude of hmm, looking at them, maybe they are potential enemies. They're different, they talk differently, they look differently. They have potential enemies, maybe. From that moment on, with that attitude, we can grow into a form of battleground mentality and rejection. Very easy. However, if we just turn the attitude slightly the other way and say, hey, maybe, maybe they are potential partners, suddenly we start finding common ground. <coughs> Suddenly, we start appreciating each other. Suddenly, we really turn people into partners. That is the, the little attitude change. Now, the world, as we know, is changing very fast. And we see cultural clashes. Now, cultural clashes can be disastrous, or, again, it can bring diversity, creativity, and prosperity. Again, attitude. But first, let us quickly quickly see the two cultures. We have Oriental culture on the one hand, we have Western culture, the main two main cultures. When you talk about Oriental culture, I just want to share this with you. My research tells me that it well, of course, it was heavily influenced by Confucianism. And the country now in this world, more Confucian than China, is not China, it's not China, it's Korea, it's Japan. They are more Confucian in their philosophy and their practice than China. Okay, what Confucius say? Just very quickly, they they preach they preach uh, harmony, goodwill, and understanding. They preach uh, uh, love and respect to your parents, to your family, to your friends. They the devotion and the maintenance of of peace and justice. But since the Opium War for the Chinese, since the Second World War for the Japanese, there has been a tremendous change in the national psyche of those nations. From a supreme arrogance state, they have suddenly found themselves down to a very low low state of inferiority complex. The psychology tells me when a person is having inferiority complex, they tend to naturally have a sense of insecurity for one. They tend to be over aggressive. They tend to be possessive. They tend to want to make as much and hold on to as much. Now, this kind of possessive tendency, not only on what they are doing, but they also try to influence their own family member. They try to own their family member. And so they want to control. This is an inferiority complex oriented behavior. But I'm glad to say, well, changing over in the Far East, they are erasing this complex 
and they are healing the wound. It takes quite a bit of awakening. <coughs> but let's look at the Western culture. Western culture is very much a Christian oriented. Then we see, without my going to say this, do you repeat again? We see democracy, we see human rights, we see free enterprise, we see work ethics. John Wellesley said it all, said it fast. Try to make as much, save as much, and give as much. But unfortunately, as we know it, they, Dr. Strangway would probably share with me, they make as much, they keep as much, but not everybody try to give as much. <laughs> But we have to change that. But what happened though, in Western society, we can almost look at a global symbol of the influence of Western culture. What do we see? The symbol could be like in television, fax, cellular phone, American Express card, Visa card, uh, all this instant gratification and instant satisfaction, leisure center activities, something that we want. And then, and then, we develop from a, a desire to, do, to want something, a desire into a want, a want into a demand. From a demand, we consider that a right. So we must have it. It's a birth right. It's God-given right. So the conflict comes. <coughs> and what makes it worse in this day and age, we see that people are being used and discarded because they are dehumanized. People become an instrument, a thing. All right, what am I saying this? I'm saying this, that I decide needs a bridging. If we are to mix the best of each together, we will come up with in our hand a very powerful tool. That's what I'm saying. Now, after having said that, how do I relate this to music? I just want to share this with you. Many of you have gone through the Expo 86. Now you, you could remember, perhaps, that when you went to the, the Canada uh, uh, Pavilion, you saw the, uh, the music production, Oh Canada, this is my home. Or you have gone over to uh, the Can Canadian Pacific Pavilion, I think, and they have uh, Rainbow Warrior, I think. Beautiful music. And so many people, like myself, came away with a lump on our throat. And in my case, there are tears in my eyes. So what am I saying? I am saying that we have a kind of music that's so, so Canadian, so multicultural, so healthy, so inspiring, so wholesome and so soothing and healing. So we don't need, we appreciate, but we don't need, okay, patriotic music or military music. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do not, we are not in need of those. We need the Canadian music of the soothing, the inspiring, the healthy, the wholesome, the healing kind. Like, oh Canada, this is my home type. And I can include that into amazing grace. I can include, this is a small world after all. And I can include Mozart in it. It is the kind of music, I'm not saying preaching that people should, okay, we learn Japanese music or we learn Chinese music, we learn Indian music, 
try. We try to learn to appreciate them. But in order to learn to appreciate them, we have to study their culture. We have to understand their culture a little bit in order to understand it. But that's fine. But the important thing is, this kind of Canadian multicultural music is so important because it lifts us up. It certainly lifts us up and brought tears to eyes like people like myself. And I always say, I have the feeling that it lifts me up to the point whereby I can touch a corner of heaven. That's what music can bring to people. That is what can bring to, 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 to a reaching a person's life. The world is watching Canada. In this, what they consider as the impossible experiment of multiculturalism. But we're going to show the world with the kind of music, with the kind of soul, with the kind of love and care that we manifest through very, from preschool days to university, to post-university, to professional time, the kind of love and harmony and compassion that we can foster in our society through the kind of music that we will, through you, through important people like you, will promote, will foster and encourage and inspire people. So therefore, as a group, you are extremely important. You can erase psychological complexes. You can heal the wound. You can bring people together. Because I think, truly, you are bridge builders. I, I want to say to you in closing, make a deliberate attempt, make a de deliberate attempt to cross you our culture into other culture. The more we understand other culture, the more we understand our own. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you very much.